Hello everyone, I'm Alan, also known as McLaren2009, and today I'm playing Derail Valley, but I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Today I decided it would probably be a cool idea if I actually went through and explained everything that I do to play Derail Valley. Like, in my previous streams, I've always made a habit of kind of, like, talking about some of the things as I was doing them. But when I watch, like, uh, other people play the same game, I sometimes get asked questions about, like, how do you actually play it? And... Basically, I decided I would try to make, I don't know if a tutorial would be the right word, but kind of like a demonstration of how I play the game. Like, the game, the game comes with a tutorial when you first start off in a new world, and they tell you how to start the locomotives, how to move, how to change the tracks, how to do all of that sort of stuff. But it doesn't really tell you a whole lot on how to actually play. And what I mean by that is... Like, nobody tells you, like... Uh, uh, well, you learn where to get the jobs from the station office, but nobody tells you, like, uh, when you actually pick up the job, like, for one, what kind of jobs are available, two, when you get the jobs, um, what do you do? in order to complete them and not get yourself stuck somewhere. Like, for instance, a few days ago, I was over at the uh, steel mill, and I was dropping off a rather small freight delivery going to uh, one of the... Uh, side tracks in the A lot and you would have no idea unless you were very familiar with where that track was you would have no idea that by dropping off on that track you have to be on a certain end of your you have to be on a certain end of the cars otherwise you're going to pull in and get stuck because there's no run around or any way to get out from back behind there. And then there are similar things like say how I always come back here to the harbor and I always go and pull into this track over here. I pull down onto the loading track because it allows me to pull past this switch right here and then back out into the E, G, and D lots instead of pulling in because it's much better to back in because then you can pull out. Nobody ever explains that. So, I am going to probably fail miserably, but I'm going to attempt to rectify that situation. So, for starters, let's run over to the station office and see what's currently available in here. Normally, what I would do is I would already have a rough idea of what kind of jobs I was going to work on, and then I would have my uh, two DE6s that are over-connected in the roundhouse, and then I would just go do those jobs. But, 
like I said in the beginning, today I'm going to try and do something a little bit different. I'm going to try and explain how I actually play the game. Now, granted, what I do is probably considered, like, boring or not the most exciting way to play, but it's at least fun for me. All right, so we'll start off. You just go into the station office. Now, since I don't run any mods, I just play the base game as it shipped. So, it's kind of like a mess. So you might find yourself thinking, well, what can I do? Well, these reddish pink jobs are shunting. That What that means is these cars are already on this yard. They're not leaving this yard. They're just getting moved around. In this specific case, this is unloading a loaded section of tanker cars. And then you're going to take them over to the tanker loading track, unload them, and then it's going to be broken up into three sections of cars because that's what this up here means three drop-offs so this is being unloaded so it's one already built fairly large crane that is going to get unloaded and then broken up into three sections of cars and dropped off at three different locations all right that's all good and fine but what does the rest of this stuff mean well you want to pay attention to how much the crane weighs like, our little DE2 over there is only supposed to take about 400 tons. And as you can see, this is getting close to 600. So, you might need two. But you also might be able to just make it move. because the harbor is generally pretty flat. But that's not all you need to know about on this sheet. You have your time bonus here, which uh, that's the amount of time that if you do it in less than that time, you get paid additional money. No big deal. Well, for me specifically, it is a big deal, because you look over here, let's go to my stats page. As you can see, I'm currently at the end of the game. I have all 19 licenses that are available for purchase in the game. And what does that mean for the deadline? I have 35% less time to still get the timeline to get the deadline bon time bonus. So, for me specifically, that means I've made peace with the fact that unless I start off with the uh, cars already coupled and most of the way done, chances are I'm never getting a time bonus. But the time bonus is something that you want to pay close attention to early on. And the reason for that is licenses are expensive. So if you do the jobs quickly and you get more money, that gets you closer and closer to buying new licenses. Now, on the subject of licenses in general, it's worth noting that the harbor is probably a terrible place to start off as a new player. Everything is heavy, everything is big, and they all require a bunch of these licenses. So, you look over at the screen, what licenses are available? You start off 
being able to drive the DE2. And it's been so long since I've done this, I don't actually know what you start off being able to do, but I would imagine you start off with the uh, freight haul license. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do. So you start off with the license for the DE2, but then the DE6 is kind of like your big heavy diesel. And then the steamer is a little bit cheaper, but it's got pretty good pulling capability. Then you have concurrent jobs. Well, what does that mean? Concurrent jobs means that you can pick up multiple jobs and have them active all at once. But the problem with doing that is by having multiple jobs active at once, you're going to start getting heavier and heavier, and you're going to start needing multiple locomotives. And then if you want to control multiple locomotives, you're going to need the license for MU, or multiple units, so that you can use the little blue cable on the ends of your locomotives. Or, if you don't have that, you're going to need this so that you can remote control your second locomotive. But the problem is, this thing is expensive. And I think you can only get it from the machine factory. But I don't know that for sure, because I got this back when the overhauled update came out, and it pretty much changed the way that I play the game forever. And it also is the reason why when the simulator update comes out, I'm going to have some growing pains where I figure out how to play the game again. But we'll get to that. <clears throat> but continuing on with what I was saying about the job sheet, you'll notice right down here, license requirements. Hazmat 1... So, this is a hazardous material. Basically, any material that can pose a hazard to the environment, personnel, or property through just regular use is a hazardous material. And these are methane, so these are flammable. Uh, you have to be able to drive the uh, shunter, and you need long tubes. Well, you'll see that pretty much all of these... Oh, wait, no, I'm, I'm stupid. No, that, that's not what that means. That means you have to have the license to do shunting jobs, and this means you have to have the license for freight jobs. <clears throat> but if you don't have any of these licenses, you'll put it into the validator over here, and it'll deny it, saying you don't have the licenses to complete this job. So, generally speaking, you probably would not want to start here with these jobs. Uh, let's see. Okay, here's a simple one that you'd probably be able to do, except there's a catch. This one, the only license you need is the license to do logistics hauls. Well, bad news. You don't start off with the ability to do logistics hauls. You have to get that license first. Now, you're probably thinking, why wouldn't you start off with the license to do logistics hauls? Like, they're lighter and easier to do, right? That is true. But... Uh, well, the only justification I've got is it generally costs more money to send a train that's empty than it does to send cargo, so you generally would do those later on. But when you look at the uh, freight hauls, well, a lot of them are... Uh, well, a lot of them require other things of you. So, that covers 
shunting jobs. That's just moving stuff around in the yard. Logistics halls are any of these that have just the uh, yellow band up here. They generally have a slightly longer time bonus, and they pay a little bit better depending on how far they have to go. But I specifically have the same limitations of this 24-minute time bonus. More than likely, I'm not going to pull it off. But what a logistics haul means is you have a set of empty cars that were just unloaded uh, off screen by like AI essentially. Uh, basically there are imaginary yard workers just hanging out in the harbor and they unloaded something off of these flat cars and now you have just empty cars on the lot, but nothing to really do with them. So instead of loading them here with like a shunting job, you're going to take the empties to another location. In this case, the goods factory, which is up here. And they will, in theory, get loaded there. So all a logistics haul is is just taking empty cars from one location to another location where they theoretically need them more. And then the last type of thing that you can get access to are freight missions. And they have these green bands up here. The freight hauls generally pay the best, but the catch is you have to pay real close attention to how much they weigh, because that kind of determines how hard it's going to be to pull that thing. Because as we said in the beginning, the DE-2 over there has a capacity of 400 tons, but that comes with a catch. That's 400 tons on flat ground. It starts getting less and less as you start going up hills. That hill right there is pretty steep. And then you could try to go out the other way. And the hill starting out isn't so bad. But once you get farther up north, closer to the mountains, the hills start getting steep again. You don't really know that until you've done it. So, what a freight haul is, you're taking loaded cars from this location and you're taking them to another location. But, there are a couple of things you should probably know about these loads in general. Freight hauls generally speaking, come from outbound tracks. So, this is... Let's look at the one for the harbor. Alright. How about... Not that one. Matter of fact, that works. Okay, no it doesn't. Alright. Good example is the E-Lot. This is where a lot of your outbound loads for the harbor go. You look right here, anyone that has an O next to it is designated as an outbound track. So whatever is sitting on this track is leaving the harbor and going somewhere else. Whereas anything designated with an I is an inbound track. So, if you're bringing something into the yard, that needs to be unloaded, 
it's going to go to one of these tracks. But with that being said, it doesn't necessarily mean that you brought in every job that is on an inbound track. Like this, Harbor Shunting 9. This was, uh, just imagine it was brought in by another crew, and this created a shunting job here in the harbor where you have to unload these and store them somewhere else. But the thing is, there's also a third option. Not half, that's a bad idea. There is also storage tracks. Anything designated with an S is a storage track. Generally speaking, the things that go on there are empty cars. So we go back over here to the station office and every one of these, like, uh, shunting jobs, they are all, well, not all of them, any, any that have to be loaded are probably on storage tracks. However, the ones that are loaded, they'll be on an inbound track, they have to be taken to a loading track, unloaded, <clears throat> and then they'll be broken up and put into storage tracks. In this specific case, this is a loaded cut of car haulers, which, coincidentally enough, that's the one that we were just looking at. This has one pickup of car haulers that you have to unload and store somewhere else. But it only has one drop-off, so you don't have to worry about it too much, because all eight of these cars are going to be unloaded and dropped off on the exact same track. But the thing that nobody tells you is that these uh, shunting jobs... Not that. Get rid of that. The uh, shunting jobs, after they're unloaded, as we've said in the past... This one has two drop-offs. Well, there are empty cars, like take this, for example, that both of those are unloading jobs, but this is a loading job. And this has two pickups, so you're going to go to different locations to find all three of these cars, and then you're going to take them over to the loading track and get them filled up with ammonia, and then all three are going to get dropped off on an outbound track. Easy enough, right? Well, the thing is, there are only but so many storage tracks at a given terminal or a given station. So, the shunting jobs, and also the logistics jobs, which we're going to get to in a second, there might be multiple unrelated loads on that track. So, like, we go over here. Here are two of the tankers. And since they are coincidentally black, they actually do pretty closely match what's written on the, uh, on the, uh, booklets. So you can generally look for what it looks like on the book, or on the sheet, and it'll tell you not just the, uh, job number, which you can go and find on all the cars, but you'll also be able to see what types of cars are in that set of cars, so you can go over here and see what they're coupled to. Let's see if we can find an example of not related loads. Alright, uh, those are car haulers, they're they only go to, like, one place. 
so they're generally going to be connected. All right, here is a shining example. This is LH97, so this, by default, just with that L, you know this is a logistics mission. Well, if we wanted to take these cars wherever it is they need to go, we have this one. This SL48, this is a shunting job. So this is not going wherever that is going. So if you want to get to that, you have to move this and put it somewhere else. Now this is the part that starts getting interesting. Let's see, that's 48. Hypothetically, what are these? 16, 39. Okay, this is even a this is an even better example because these are all flat cars. So like this one is SL39. That's getting loaded with something, but 39 is not 16. This right here is a logistics mission. These cars are being taken somewhere else to be loaded outside of here. The good news is the logistics halls, even though they're on a track, they're already built together. So like everything that's connected to this cut of cars is going to the same place. LH16, LH16. And then we can go all the way back and still 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. All right, it's looking like these might all be the same section of cars. So just like the car haulers, these are already assembled and going to the same place. So, there is LH-16, and then all the car haulers are also the same logistics mission. But then you look over here, these are uh, stake cars holding, like, pipes and stuff. This is a shunting job, SU-94. And then we can run along this entire section, and all of these are connected. The thing that makes shunting jobs interesting is you don't always have easy access to the cars that you need. You may need to move different things out of the way in order to get to the ones that you want. And the thing that makes it really weird is, say I wanted to do these logistics missions. Hypothetically, say these were going to the same place. I'm pretty sure they're not, but hypothetically say that they were. I want to grab this cut of cars, and I want to grab those car haulers. Well, I can't get to the car haulers unless I move those, and I can't get to those unless I move that. Well, where do I move them? What do I do with them? Well, th that's the part that's kind of, like, left up to you to decide. Like, if I have my heart set on doing the logistics missions, I'm just going to take this random flat car and shove it anywhere that it's going to fit. And then I'll take that random flat car and shove it anywhere that it's going to fit. Well, what if I didn't have my heart set on doing the logistics missions? What if I wanted to do the shunting missions just moving around in here? Well, you can do that. But there's going to be a bit of a problem. You see, you can find all of the, all of the cars that make up SL-48... You don't necessarily know where they're going to be. And then you do the shunting job. 
And then at a busy station like the harbor is, you may find yourself um, trying to shove a now assembled cut of cars onto a track with other stuff. And it starts getting weird when the uh, combined cuts of cars start reaching past the uh, lines of the track that you're trying to fit them on. Now, the reason that I'm going into all of these uh, bizarre amounts of detail for the shunting and logistics missions, they pretty much only go to storage tracks. Like, take these, for example. If I had to guess, those are probably going to the machine factory. Mm, nope. Need to go back. It'll be so much better when, uh, when we can press little buttons to cycle through. Okay. Okay, the, this might actually be the best possible idea. All right, so these hypothetically are probably going to the machine factory in town. Being as these are empty, that logistics mission is probably going to either 2S, 1S, or 6S in the B and C lots. So C2S, B1, and B6S. Those are any of the possible places that it can go. Well, you'll notice that I just listed off three tracks there's a slim chance that when you get to the machine factory, there's going to be something sitting on that track. So you're going to end up burying something in that track. And by burying something, you're going to end up intentionally doing what we have right here, where we have a shunting job in front of the logistics job. Except now it's going to be the other way around. You're going to have the logistics job in front of the shunting job. And when you start shuffling around the cars and doing the shunting jobs, if you do too many of them, you may accidentally, like, overload something, and then you just can't do any more of that job type because there's nowhere to put it. So if you want to hypothetically do every shunting job in the harbor, you're going to hit a wall at some point. And you're going to end up like uh, pushing something too far and fouling a switch. Something crazy like that. So Empty cars pretty much only go to storage tracks. Loaded cars, if they need to get unloaded, go to inbound tracks. If they have been loaded, they go to outbound tracks. And then that kind of gives you an idea that you start figuring out what the layout is of a given terminal or yard. And then the uh, freight missions it's pretty straightforward. They get loaded and put onto an outbound track. You hook up to them on the outbound. You go to the next station and they go to an inbound track. Then that creates a shunting job where you take the inbound cars or you take them from the inbound track to the loading track to get them unloaded. And then they'll get split up and dumped on storage tracks where they could potentially create another job where they get loaded again, 
or they create a logistics job where they're not going to stay here, they're going to go somewhere else and get loaded there. Hypothetically. And then the cycle continues. It is entirely possible to pick up, like... Say we do take those uh, car haulers over to the machine factory. It is entirely possible that we take those to the machine factory... And then after we turn in the job booklet, it's going to create a shunting job at the machine factory where we load those with cars, put them on an outbound track, and then say it cre after you turn in that job booklet, it creates a freight mission where you take the uh, now loaded car haulers and run them down back here to the harbor. I don't know if it'll just keep doing it like that, but that is the idea. Like, the uh, only example I've got of a time where it did not work like that was when I was taking cars from the... Uh, military base here in the harbor and going up to the mountain military base which would be that way approximately that way ish like many miles that way and i was bringing logistics cars just empty flat cars from here to up there and then when we get up there, well, the only stuff that's loaded up there, or at least the only stuff I've seen, has been like the uh, uh, Hazmat 3, Military 3, um, classified like biohazard cargo. So when I took the uh, flat cars up there, rather than creating... A Oh, well. I'm sorry, I'm a little late getting your message. But, uh, yeah, as, as I was saying, um, when you go up there, instead of creating a shunting job where you load the questionable, like, uh, Resident Evil bioweapon cargo, I had the game kind of, like, fail on me. And it just had the cars just there on the storage track without a job number. So I couldn't do anything with it. But for the most part, when you take one job to another place, you can generally do something with those cars at that location. So if we just took the uh, car haulers and nothing else, we could get to the machine factory, back up onto the storage track, and then turn in the logistics haul booklet, and then there would be, hypothetically, a shunting job where we fill it with cars, and then we don't even have to get unhooked. We just pull forward, pull out, back up onto the loading track, get them filled up, and then get backed up onto the outbound track. And then, hypothetically, we go back to the station office, and now there's a freight job that can take those same cars to another place. And the game is kind of cool like that. And there's just, like, uh, kind of like loops. Like, uh, the coal mine, iron mines, and the steel mill. Pretty much all of those things. You can get jobs going from, like, the coal mine to the steel mill. And then when you bring the coal down to the steel mill, you unload the coal. Then you take the empty gondolas from the steel mill back to the coal mine. 
And there's just a lot of stuff like that in this game. And there's just a lot of stuff that you can do and work on. All right, we've uh, spent a lot of time just talking about the types of jobs that are available and what you can do with them. So, instead, let's actually do a job or several. All right. Mm. Anything good going somewhere cool? All right, we have acetylene and intermodal containers. We have clothing. Acetylene's pretty light. Clothing's heavy-ish. These are all on flat cars, by the way. All right, that's what we're going to do. All right, let's just take our uh, empty car haulers. We're going to the machine factory. All right. This is what we're going to do. Alright. So, let's get the clothing. Let's get the acetylene. No. Okay. Alright. E11. G1, but we already knew where that one was. And E2. Okay, perfect. I was going to do this demonstration just using the, uh, the, uh, DE2, but since I'm actually going to carry real cargo out of here, I'm not going to do it that way. Let me get a drink real quick, though. Okay. All right. So, in order to work on this, I need my locomotives. Alright, but while we're here, I should explain why I am about to do what I'm going to do. Alright, let's go, let's just go over here first. Let's go over to the E-Track. Let's make sure we're aligned for it. We are. Oh. No, that's going to F. We need to go to this switch. Alright, good. We're still aligned to E. My general rule that I like to go by is just making sure that the tracks are aligned in such a way that you can just go completely through the industry end to end without hitting anything. So, we go over here. We know that both of our loaded cuts of cars are on the E-Track. So, we can look at our station map and we know that this is the E-Zone. This is where a bulk of the outbound cars are located. This specific lot is organized from left to right as you're facing the uh, east end of the harbor. So this one's on E2, this one's on E11. So this one is this section right here, and then this one will be all the way over here. And looks like those ones right there. All right, awesome. Now, why did we come over here? Well, what I want to do is go over to these, and what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the weight. This right here is a flat car. Clearly. It weighs 11,000 kilograms. These 
are small intermodal shipping containers filled with acetylene. Unless you have like a comparable background in welding, for example, you might not necessarily know what acetylene is or what it's used for. But the bottom line is it is a fuel gas that you burn it to heat things up, cut, and you can weld with it. But you're probably thinking, well, this is a box. Well, the acetylene is inside of the box. I highly doubt it's modeled, but the bottom line is there is something flammable containing a liquefied gas in these boxes. Well, this is 11,000 kilograms. This is 19,000 kilograms. So by their powers combined, we have 30,000 kilograms just in one car. So we go over here. We're going to need to look at this too. That's uh, 23,000 kilograms for just the car hauler. We need to bear that in mind for the uh, empty car haulers over there. All right, so we got 30,000 kilograms in acetylene. And then we go over here to 11. And let's look right here. This is the same 11,000 kilograms of an empty flat car and 31,000 kilograms of clothing. Which, for me personally, that makes sense. Clothing is heavy. A lot heavier than you think. So, this is actually about 42,000 kilograms just for this car. So, to have a decent weight distribution, you want to put your heavy stuff up, up to the front closest to your locomotives. And then you want to get progressively lighter and lighter as you go farther back and farther away from your power source. I don't know how it would work comparatively if you had locomotives on both ends. Then I guess the lighter things are in the middle sandwiched between the two groups of locomotives and heavy cars. I don't know. I don't work for the railroad yet. Still working on doing it in real life. But the reason that I do it this way is because while I have not worked on the railroad directly, I am a truck driver. And when you have multiple trailers... You have your heavy trailer closest to the tractor, and then you have l progressively lighter trailers as you move back, if you have doubles and triples. And the reason for that is, well, with a truck, we have what's called the uh, crack the whip effect. Oh, that's uh, one of the things that it's called. Basically, when you go around a corner, or when the, when the entire combination vehicle goes around a corner. If you have the uh, heavy trailer at the back of a set of triple trailers, you're going to go around the corner, and then the heavy thing is going to keep, like, sn is going to, like, snap out on you. And then it can either, at best, it will just jerk the... Uh, truck and leading trailers over in the direction that the heavy trailer is going. At worst, it'll cause it to roll. Well, in my mind, it only stands to reason that that same effect is going to happen with a train. 
you don't know this unless you've worked on trains or you've worked on cars, but you look right here at the truck on the train car. Now, I was a welder in a factory that built train cars. You don't know this unless you've done something similar, but there is nothing holding this frame on the truck. It's not modeled very clearly, but at the top of the truck, uh, probably the best example would be like right here. At the top of the truck, there is like this uh, big round like disc and there's a pin in the middle of the disc. And you lower the uh, center sill, basically like the spine of the car, onto these trucks. And there is a pin in between the uh, underside of the center sill above the truck and the truck itself. And then there's a pin that sits in the middle. And the only thing holding it on the wheels is just weight, gravity, and friction. There are no bolts holding this onto the wheels. You can just pick it right off and roll the wheels out from under it, which actually makes it a lot easier to repair and replace these. But that's another thing entirely. So, if you put the heavy thing at the back and you take like a sharp turn, hypothetically, it will just keep going and you're going down the rails, you make your turn, and you just topple over. They're kind of top-heavy. Especially these. Tankers are really top-heavy. So, generally speaking, what you want to do is you have the heavy things up front, and you get lighter as you go back. But one of the things that it can potentially do in real life, if you have the heavy thing in the back and the light thing up front, it can do what's called a string line derailment. And say this cut of cars is rolling down the rails. A string line derailment would be if, say, this specific car pops off the rails, but the other ones don't. If this car was empty and all of those were loaded, this increases the chance that the empty one can just pop off. I don't know how to properly explain it because I haven't been like properly trained. It's just stuff I've been picking up from a bunch of other sources. I could be wrong, and that might not technically be why it happens, but that is something that can happen. And you can see it in this game if, say, you uh, want to bring the caboose with you but you don't want to go through the hassle of keeping it at the back of the train. So you figure, well, I want the effects of having the uh, boost to my remote control signal. It's like, I want, the, I want the boost to my radio reception, but I don't want to put it at the back of the train, so I'll just slap it on the back of my locomotives. Well, that can potentially cause some problems. If you're carrying loaded cargo, 
you're going to know that the caboose isn't particularly heavy. So you basically have your locomotives, which are very heavy. And then you have your caboose, which is comparatively light. And then you have your cargo, which is generally very heavy. And it just kind of like pulls and just does weird things with the... Uh, it just does weird things with the cars and the load in general. So that knowledge base that I have from driving trucks and all of the testing and coursework I had to do to get my commercial driver's license, I carried that mindset over with me to approaching trains. Uh, but whatever. That's the uh, reasoning behind why I put the heavy things up front. Now, if hypothetically we had things that were the same weight, my next priority would be organizing it in such a way that I have easy access to whatever section of cars is getting dropped off first. All right, and now let's go over to the... No, that's F. That's the passenger terminal. Let's go over to G. All right, we need to get these up front, so put that away. It's a good idea to make sure your tracks are aligned. To get where you need to go. And this is going to be specifically the uh, thing that I was talking about earlier, where I have to uh, shove this flat car somewhere. Now, me personally, my first priority would be to put it here onto this storage track. But it's going to be interesting because these are light. This is 23,000 kilograms. Just for one car. So this will be the last thing that I hook up. Uh, you know what? I kind of want to bring it. So let's go grab my remote. Caboose. Alright. So, Caboose is 22,000 kilograms. Easy day. We're going to bring this with me. Or, I'm going to bring it with me. Since I started streaming, I've started, like, uh, uh, talking to chat and acting as if they're involved in the process so I don't feel like I'm going crazy. But deep down, I'm still going crazy. All right, so this can safely be behind this. And it won't cause any problems whatsoever. All right, so now that we know where everything is located, we also know the order in which we have to do it. So, the empty cars are very light. So, they're going to go last. The acetylene is comparatively light. So, it's going to go second. And the close over here on E11 are gonna go first. So we go over here, check all of our switches. This switch is currently aligned to the main. We don't need it aligned to the main. We need it aligned to E11 out. All right, now we've got all of that in place. 
what we don't have is locomotives. So let's run over here to the roundhouse, and even though we're an hour into this, we are now going to go get a locomotive. Well, actually, two locomotives. Because I was fortunate enough to get uh, two DE6s that are in sequential order. Locomotive 76 and 77. So I just bring them everywhere with. So, we go over here, and let's go up here, let's put my map in here, turn on the cab light, even though it doesn't really do a whole lot, apply the independent, release the train brake. We don't have power yet, but it's the thought that counts. All right flipped up all of the breakers. Now let's start the engine. It was kind of funny when I first got the uh, license for the DE6, I didn't know how to start it. I honestly had to go online and look at a YouTube video telling me how to turn the thing on. Like, it was literally the last year that I started playing uh, Train Sim World. And Train Sim World tells you how to start up a locomotive, from how to do a cold start. And I don't remember if there was a manual yet for the DE6. It's anyone's guess. Kind of funny when I realized I've been playing Derail Valley long enough that uh, I remember back before we had an independent break. This was literally the first game I got when I got an Oculus Rift. Alright, so with the controls for the for the locomotives in general, and this applies to the DE6, and it also applies to the DE2, uh, it might be easier to do this in the cab, but we'll get there. But your independent brake, that is just the brakes on the locomotive itself. And since these are connected with the MU cable, which is this thing right here. Really? You're going to do this to me now? Alright, so that little uh, blue cable right there, that's the uh, MU cable. There's a license you have to get in order to use it. Alright, we're just going to pretend we didn't see that, and we're going to carry out the plan of the day. Alright, independent brake is just the brake for the locomotive. You apply that brake, and just the uh, brake shoes on the locomotive are going to kick in. The train brake, however, is... Well, as the name kind of implies, if you're a fan of other simulators, you might better recognize it as the automatic brake. And I think the reason for that is it's computer controlled so that it automatically distributes braking power based on the uh, length of the train where the cargo is and it tries to gradually apply the brakes evenly so you stop in a smooth manner fitting of whatever you're carrying. 
like, for instance, uh, Freight doesn't really worry about getting Whiplash, so you can kind of stop whenever, whereas Passengers, if you slam on the brakes and everybody, like, jerks forward in their seats, they're probably going to complain about that. So when you do the little uh, cutout valve on a real locomotive that switches between uh, freight and passenger, I think putting it on passenger means the brakes get applied, get lighter pressure so that it takes longer to stop short of an emergency. But I could be wrong about that. As I've said millions of times, I do not work for the railroad. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> but the bottom line is the independent brakes are just the brakes for the locomotives. So if you pull the if you pull the lever in one of the locomotives connected with the MU cable, it automatically pulls it in the other. It works a little bit different with the real ones, but that's not important because this isn't a real one. It may look like a locomotive, but it's not a replica of any real piece of equipment. It's just inspired by them. As the uh, developers themselves have said on Discord. So, independent, just the locomotives, train brake is everything. Except it's worth noting that they both are air brakes. And uh, when the simulator update comes out, and uh, we get a gauge specifically for the brake cylinder. That is the uh, brake, that is the gauge for the cylinder of the locomotive that it's mounted on. So if you throw the, if you pull the independent brake lever, it'll show air being in the cylinder for the locomotive. but it won't be in the cylinders of the cars. Whereas if you pull the uh, train brake lever, there will be air in the cylinder for the locomotives, and there will also be air in the cylinder for the cars, thus activating the brakes. And you have to be careful with how you use the train brake because it's worth noting just how it does what it's doing. Basically, you pull the lever and that, that pushes air into the uh, brake cylinder. So now there's a difference of pressure between the cylinder and the reservoir. And uh, basically it's going to try to equalize and balance out. And then it'll apply a comparable amount of braking force based on the pressure difference between the two systems or something to that effect. But the bottom line is, when you release the lever, it has to build pressure back up to normal working pressure, which as of right now is four bars. On... Mm, I think you would call this like a medium duty locomotive. It would be 89 PSI, which is a different unit of measure, but we're not going down that road. <laughs> um, 
but it has to build its air pressure back up. And once it's at full working pressure again, the brakes are released. Or the brakes are fully released. It's kind of a crazy system. But the point is, you just open it far enough that you see results. Like you see your speed start to go down and then pretty much close it again because you're still going to be braking until you get your pressure back up to working pressure. So you're still going to be slowing down until the pressure equalizes again and all the air is out of the cylinder. Or at least I think that's probably the best way to explain it. Yeah, so you apply the train brake. It's going to take time to take effect because it has to propagate through all the cars in the train. And then the inverse of that is also true. When you turn off the brake, it has to get pipe pressure up throughout the entire train in order for the brakes to be fully released. And that takes time. So you only use enough of the train brake to get the job done don't just like throw open the valve and just like dump the tank that's just a bad idea in general just don't do that all right, all right now with this specifically trying to couple with these cars I found that going seven kilometers an hour is too much for the flat cars. Six seems to be fine, but generally speaking, what I try to do is just keep it at five. And another thing that I've started to realize that you want to do, you notice it way more with the uh, steamer but when you first bump into the cars, you want to apply the independent brake. Otherwise, you may have the misfortune that your train will bounce off of these bumpers here and it'll just start pulling away and you have to shove it back again and then try to get it to hold in place with the independent brake. Otherwise, you're going to try to throw the chain over and it's just not going to work. Stuff like that. Now, since the game hates me, I have started always coupling from the rearmost vehicle to the frontmost vehicle. But I say the game hates me because we go over here and okay as of this exact moment the front vehicle is connected to the back vehicle i jokingly refer to this as a schrodinger's coupling mechanism it's uh, simultaneously in a quantum superposition where it's both coupled back to front and front to back like they're both coupled at the exact same time and the only time it's different is when you observe it like Every time I've streamed this, and I've streamed this game a lot in the last two months, every time I go back to look at this, somehow it's in the wrong position. All right. Or it, I should say it's not in the wrong position. It's not in the position that I set it in. So we have the hook over, tighten down the hook, or tighten it down, bring them closer together, connect the air lines, open up the air valves, or open up the valves, and in theory, we're connected. So now the thing that I like to do, this will change completely when the, uh, not, I don't, I don't think it's coming in simulator. I think it'll be after it, 
but when the following update comes out, they said they're going to bring out an end of crane device that for one apparently it'll appear on the map so that you can track where the back of your crane is and the function of the end of crane device at least here in the u.s it tells you what the pressure is at the back of the train so in order to find out if we have pressure i like to go back to the very last car and crack open the angle cock and listen for air to come out now that is not the thing to do with a train. That's another one of those weird things that, for me specifically, carries over from working on trucks. If you have uh, multiple trailers, it it's kind of weird that I know all of this because I never actually took the test for doubles and triples. But there were questions about it on the general knowledge test for the written portion of getting a commercial driver's license. So what you do with the converter dollies and succeeding trailers as you get farther down the chain, you go to the next vehicle in the sequence and you open up the uh, emergency air or you release the uh, trailer brakes with the uh, red brake valve in the cab of the tractor. And then you go to each vehicle in the sequence and you open up the uh, red valve on the back of the trailer or the back of the converter dolly or the top of the converter dolly. And you listen to see if air is coming out. And then you do that for all the trailers and all the converter dollies to make sure that air is going through the system. In theory, all you need to do is go to the very last trailer or go to the back of the very last trailer and open up the valve. And if you hear and feel air coming out, there's air going through the system. So you close it back up. But to be proper with it, what you want to do is check every vehicle. Check every component in the, in the sequence. Now, like I said, there's a device on the railroad that basically does that for you. And you basically have a radio controlled remote that tells you what is the uh, pressure in the brake pipe at the back of the train. And to kind of elaborate on what I was saying about the brakes earlier, it might be easier to say that the working pressure is in the brake pipe and the brake pipe is running the entire length of the train. There's one in the locomotives, and there's one in all of the cars. And that's part of what the air hose is. You can see it right there. And when you hit the lever, you take air pressure from the brake pipe and put it into the brake cylinder. And then air in the cylinder applies the brakes but it can only do that if there's air in the pipe if you let all the air out you can't apply the brakes anymore it, it's kind of a weird thing that's very hard to explain without being like properly trained to explain it Like, I can explain a lot of things. I've had some training as, like, a science teacher in training. I can explain things. It's just... I don't know if I know it well enough to explain it properly. I've always believed that it's a good example 
it's a good sign of how well you know something is how well can you explain it to someone who knows absolutely nothing about it. And my best way of explaining it is by using examples of things that I do understand and showing you how they're similar and how they're different. Like, for instance, my experience is with trucks, combination tractor trailers. Since the uh, late 1980s, early 90s, all trucks and trailers have had, uh, well, they've had spring breaks since like the 60s, but they've had uh, anti-locking brakes and uh, other fun stuff like that. But the point is, trucks and trailers have what's called spring brakes, where there's a chamber uh, mounted inside near the uh, drum, near the brake drum. The uh, air actuated disc brakes are kind of like the thing of the future, but I haven't actually seen them in person yet. I know they're there, but I just haven't seen them or gotten to interact with them. But there's a chamber with a giant spring in it or not not a giant spring but i mean it's pretty good size but it has a spring in it and the way that you release the brakes on a trailer and also the parking brake on a tractor is you push in the valve in the tractor and it forces 120 PSI through the uh, emergency airline. And that 120 PSI compresses the spring. And then once the spring is compressed, the brake is released. Then there's another spring that's on the service brake side of the chamber where when you press the uh, pedal, it sends air into uh, uh, push the uh, other the smaller spring in and actuate the drum brakes. But the important thing is with trucks there is a spring loaded chamber that keeps the uh, trailer locked in place and it fails on so that if you lose air the brakes lock so it's like a safety feature with trucks that they have to fail on Well, trains do not work like that. There is no spring in this. But if you hypothetically had a 100 car consist, can you imagine how much it would suck if you had to maintain uniform 120 pounds per square inch of pressure through all 100 cars and if it falls below say 60 psi the spring locks in place and then it just creates like the uh problem with uh um electronics in a series circuit where you have one failure and now it's cut off the air supply for everything back. So now you've got to troubleshoot and find out which one has the leak and cause the system to fail. And it brings the whole thing to a grinding halt. That would be an absolute nightmare. So with 
cranes, you need working pressure to apply the brakes. If you don't have pressure, you can't apply the brakes. So all of the locomotives have an air compressor. It's not simulated yet in the game, but that's not important. I mean, it is, and it's coming, but it's not important for what I'm trying to do. So you have working pressure just chilling in the brake pipe actually in all of the uh, reservoirs on all of the cars and on the locomotives. But that that's another thing that we probably shouldn't get too spun around the axle for. And the... And then supposedly... And we're going to need to apply the some brakes on that. The uh, track's a little bit glitchy. I should not have applied the train brake. But yeah, what I'm dealing with right now is there are uh, some switches that kind of act like a speed bump and they either slow you down or derail you completely. And I'm trying to like force my way through invisible barrier just to get moving. And that's really, really dangerous, not just because of these, but because of those. Clothes are not volatile in any way, shape, or form. Acetylene is very volatile. I don't think it's shock sensitive, but we don't want to slam into it at any amount of speed. So we have to throttle up far enough to get past our invisible speed bump, but not fast enough that when it goes over our invisible speed bump, it takes off like a rocket and turns our acetylene containers over here into rockets. Uh, basically, I've told that story a couple of times in the past about back when I was in welding school and watching all these uh, safety videos on uh, industrial accidents related to welding. And one of them was specifically a warehouse of nothing but acetylene that just spontaneously exploded. Not a good time. Not fun for the whole family. So, like I said earlier, go to the back, crack open the valve. The cars are connected. Pull forward. Hit the horn for good luck. And let's pull out of here. Now, one of the things that I picked up from uh, Train Sim World, specifically Train Sim World 3, 2 did not teach you that, did not teach me this. I specifically learned it in 3. But what you want to do is when you come to a complete stop, you apply the train brake, apply the independent brake, come to a complete stop, release the train brake, release the train brake, fully apply the independent brake, then slowly apply the throttle so that the uh, ammeter, the uh, amp gauge, increases, saying there's power being sent to the traction motors. Not in the game yet, but the ammeter is coming with the simulator update. So, ho hold on for that. So, apply the throttle until you see the ammeter go up. Then, release the independent brake 
and you'll go forward. Or backwards, depending on how you're set. And the reason that you do this is so that you do not roll backwards down the hill. And to kind of put it into perspective of why I should have already known that that was a thing. When I got my commercial driver's license to drive trucks, I was taught how to drive a truck using a 10 speed manual transmission. By being taught with a 10 speed manual, I do not have the restriction on my license saying I can only drive an automatic truck. My school did not want us to have that restriction. So, I uh, was taught and certified with a manual truck. And being tested with a manual truck one of the things that they will automatically fail you for with a manual is you're going to do a hill start. And what is special about a hill start? Well, you're on a hill. If you release the brake, you're going to roll down the hill. Well, you can't roll back down the hill because, more than likely, there is something behind you. There is more than likely some random car in your blind spot hugging the ICC bumper on the back of your trailer. And if you roll back, you're going to damage their car and you will be at fault. So, the they will literally take you to a place that has a hill and more than likely a red light. And you're going to come to a complete stop and you have to start on that hill without rolling back. So the way that you do it is you keep your foot on the brake. You slowly release the clutch until you feel the truck, st or until you feel it start to like vibrate and you know that the clutch is taking hold and uh, power is starting to be sent to the wheels. And then once you feel it vibrate, saying it's taking hold, you reduce, you release pressure on the brake pedal and then fully release the clutch, fully release the brake, and you should be uh, rolling forward. Or if you're carrying something extremely heavy, you should be held in place long enough that you can hit the uh, fuel pad. You can hit the accelerator and keep moving. Now, how does that translate to the train? Well, you use the independent brake to keep you in place because the engine and traction motors don't care in the slightest about the independent brake. You can burn clear through. Just set the independent, just give the throttle like a notch or two if you're up in the cab, release, in, release the independent, and the engine is already trying to make you move, and the only thing stopping you is the independent brake, so you release the independent brake, and you go forward. But the point is, it allows you to go forward without rolling back down the hill. Good times. So, anytime you're stopping on a hill, um, make sure that you use the independent brake to stop you from rolling in a direction you don't want to go. And then you may notice that I'm only applying a little bit of the train brake. And there's a reason for that. You don't need a lot of braking power, 
especially going these insanely l slow speeds that I personally do in the yard. So, you, if you want to use all of the cars to stop the train, you use the train brake. But you don't need a lot of braking force to stop at slow speeds on flat ground. So you just crack open a little bit so that you see your speed start to drop. And then more than likely, if you're going at like yard speed, you can just release it completely. And you'll still be slowing down as you're doing it. But um, because you, you won't the brakes won't be released until the pressure is back up to normal working pressure. So you just crack open the train brake just a little bit, and then you're golden. Then close it back up, let your air pressure build back up. But do apply the independent brake because the independent brake will hold you in place once you've stopped. Now, there is a bit of a catch to that. And if you're really heavy and on a steep hill, uh, well, for one, starting out is probably going to suck if you're going up the hill. If you're going down the hill, you won't have any problems, but have your hand on the train brake lever just in case it starts getting a little out of hand. But uh, if you're going uphill, uh, you're probably going to need to apply four or five notches on the throttle before you release the independent. Otherwise, you uh, may um, basically overwhelm your independent brake and just roll down the hill anyway. And obviously, that would be a really bad time with heavy and or explosive cargo. So, generally, even though the yards are flat for the most part, not all the places that you go are going to be flat. So it's a good practice to just get used to uh, stop, apply the independent, apply the throttle, release the independent. Yeah, it, it's just a good habit to be in to do it that way. Ranting for like a long time. All right, so now we're getting to the part that's going to get interesting. And what I mean by that is what I should have done was grab the DE2 and use the DE2 to get the uh, single flat car out of the way. But... We're starting off making bad decisions, so what's one more? Alright, so this is currently aligned to the main track, but we're not going down the main track. We're going over to G. And what's going to make it interesting is we have this long train. Well, it's not that long. It's actually rather short all things considered but we have this train and we're going to use all of this to move one flat car and you'll probably immediately see why with the uh, simulator update they're removing the ability to use the remote with the DE6s
uh, just because you would do yard switching work with an intermediate locomotive. Um, sometimes even two or three of them, depending on how much you're moving. In Derail Valley, the DE6 is not an intermediate locomotive. The DE6 is your heavy locomotive. So if you're using, like, your full power locomotive to do, like, just moving stuff around in the yard, that's not a very efficient use of your fuel. It's expensive to run the DE6s, so you don't want to use them for little stuff like this. So you would build this uh, a, a jumbled mess of a consist using the DE2, or multiple DE2s if it gets too heavy, and then after the train is fully built and assembled, and put on like a holding or like staging area, then you'll back up the DE6s and pull them out of here. But we're not doing all that. We're gonna do it the hard way because why not? Now, these cases here are a little bit weird. Because on one hand, I want to apply the independent brake so that it doesn't pull forward like it just did. But I don't know if since these are empty and rather light, if they'll just uh, get shoved and just pushed farther down the line. You obviously don't want that to happen. So now let's pull forward. You don't need to go very fast, but you can't even see the locomotives. They're up around the bend up there. But we're going to take this flat car and we're going to shove it in here because we're not overly worried about it. And I need to be on this side because that's where the switch is. Now, you may notice that I manually switch switches for the most part. Even though I have the handheld remote, I just prefer doing it this way. It feels like more immersive and more involved. All right, so train brake, independent, and just that little barely initial reduction is all it takes to get this to stop. Flip it into reverse, throttle up, kick off the independent. You'll notice that as the train gets heavier, you'll need to throttle up farther to get it rolling. And the same mentalities with a hill start as well. Now, one thing that's worth mentioning about this type of thing specifically is in order for like the job to register as being completed, you have to get the uh, car past the sign marking that track. So it has to be between those signs marking the track. All right. Now, I do have to mention 
that uh, I don't it I don't think it's supposed to work like this, but the way that the game is set up right now pre-simulator update the brakes kind of work closer to truck brakes than they do to train brakes like you may notice that if you're taking like uh, last week I took a load of excavators from the machine factory to the coal mine. And I carried that in conjunction with uh, ammunition going from the machine factory military base to the mountain military base. And that meant that I had to stop outside of the military base to... Uh, back the ammunition into the military base. So, in order to do that, that meant I had to drop off my excavators on a hill. Well, it turns out that's a bit of a problem. Because if you uh, don't apply any brakes, the cars are just going to roll down the hill. And that's a bit of a problem, because if they rolled down the hill it would really quickly block my path out of the uh, out of the military base. So, how in the world do you address that? Well, it turns out that as of right now, the uh, brakes are closer to that of a trailer. If you let all of the air out, the brakes are applied. It's not supposed to work like that. But until the simulator update comes out, that is currently how it works. So when you stop the cars, if you want them to stay where you left them, on the hill and not roll forward with you, uncouple and dump the air. Do not do that after the simulator update comes out because with a real train car, if you dump out all of the air, you can't apply the brakes anymore because you need air for the brakes to work which is why they're adding the handbrakes. So realistically, when the simulator update comes out, I'm going to have to do another uh, long, quote-unquote, tutorial stream where we figure out how to do this properly. It's like where we do this all over again. And I'm going to have to explain it in even more detail because the systems will be implemented properly. Although, all things considered, or if everything goes well and according to plan, by the time that comes around, I myself will have actual hands-on training with these systems, and I'll be able to better explain how they're supposed to work in real life. But just know that as of this exact moment, if you want the cars to stay in place on a hill, dump the air. It's completely counterintuitive to how it really works, but it's the workaround we have to deal with until the update comes out which they're saying most likely June. I know everybody's kind of like hoping that they said they said Q2, so like uh, Q2 starts like in two weeks. So is the update coming in April? No, do not expect April. June was their estimate, unless something crazy comes up and delays it again. But, in their defense, they pretty much rebuilt the entire game. 
like every system with how these things work and interact with each other, everything was redone. Like it's insane the amount of work that's gone into it. And we've only seen like little, little glimpses of it through the uh, 30 second update videos on the Discord channel. But just those 30 second clips, basically everything is getting, is getting repaired. Like it is, it, it is truly insane the amount of things that they've, that they're correcting and redoing. Alright, so, release that. Activate the air. Now, let's go to the back of my car haulers. And let's crack open the valve. And good news! We are back far enough that we don't have to shove back any further to get the caboose. Alright, now we got a caboose. Wonderful. Probably thinking. So go back to the back of the caboose. Boom, we've got air. Although realistically, that was probably a complete waste of time because the caboose is literally one car. And the game does not have the system where like the brake pipe on like a car can fail. So by opening up that valve, I know that I opened up both valves going into the caboose. So just by seeing myself do that, I already know that air is going to come out of this. So I didn't need to do that, but I did it anyway because I'm demonstrating something. Awesome. All right. So <coughs> go forward, apply some brakes so that we stay in place, even though the yard is flat ish. In theory, I should have applied the brakes immediately when I made contact with the cars, but there's a slim chance that the car might just keep rolling. Now, generally, it would only keep rolling if there was still, like, air in the uh, pipe for the car. And, as I've said multiple times, that is not how this works. But, it's what we've got. So, the only way that they would keep moving as the game sits right now is if you've previously already moved them and they've got air in them. Otherwise, they would be locked in place because they don't have air. Which, as we've already said, is a bit counterintuitive because that's not how this works, but it's what we've got. So just bear that in mind when you're shoving random things around here in the yard. But kind of to touch on what I was saying earlier about the uh, shunting and logistics jobs here in the yard... You have to remember what things you've moved and ideally where you've moved them to. Like, there is still a job booklet in the office over there for SL48. Except the booklet is going to tell you that this car is on this track. So if you want to be good, 
and uh, pretend you're properly doing the right job, I can back up, hook up to this car and put it back on this track. I'm not going to do that because I'm not that dedicated to the cause. And quite frankly, when you go out of range of the harbor, everything's going to despawn and they're going to create new jobs anyway. So in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. But you have to be conscious of things like this because let's say instead of just taking the three jobs that I took, what if I wanted to do the uh, shunting job where I unload that set of car haulers and then dump them on a storage track and then bring them along? with the newly created logistics job of take those empty car haulers to the machine factory. Well, in order to do that, I have to unload it, drop it off wherever it needs to go, and then keep in mind that whatever storage track those get dumped on, it's probably going to bury something else. So if you're doing a lot of jobs in close proximity, you have to be conscious of the fact that you may inadvertently be stepping on your own toes. It, it's kind of weird and hard to explain, but it is what it is. Alright, and we've naturally come to a complete stop sort of right there and uh, just for the sake of like uh, safety uh, don't just casually stand in the tracks that's a good way to get hit by something in the factory I worked in y you would literally get fired for going out onto the uh, active tracks. And the reason for that is because the uh, live tracks are actively being used by the railroad that shared a facility with us. And if you go out onto those, there's a real good chance you could actually get hit. So rather than dealing with the liability of you getting run over by a train, they told us, just don't go on the tracks. Now, the actual railroad employees, they only go on the tracks if their job specifically requires them to do so. Other times, it's like a safety incident. But their job would require them to, to go onto the tracks, whereas hours in the factory does not. And then another thing that I did not talk about was that I try to uh, set up my locomotives in such a way that I back up to pick up all of the things that I'm trying to carry. I organize them according to weight and then I organize them according to where they're getting dropped off. And I try to do every job in such a way that I'm pulling out of the station. Now, more than likely, I'm going to have to continue on with this uh, another day. But it's uh, worth noting that I have my two locomotives up there. They were all set up specifically with the goal of pulling forward out of the west entrance or yeah the west entrance to the harbor and going up that way 
because that's the way that I'm trying to go. So I try to make it so that my uh, locomotives are facing the way that I want to go. And then I every every little movement that I make in the yard, specifically about like that uh, turnaround in the Y at the C track and all of that, it's all with the interest of having my locomotives facing that direction. That way I back the uh, loads into the yard that they're going to. And then I back in and then I pull out whatever load I'm taking with me. And that is particularly important because I will refuel my locomotives after I'm... Uh, like, I'll refuel my locomotives at the roundhouse after I'm done with whatever it is I'm working on in the harbor at that time. And it's important because I want them facing this direction so we back into the roundhouse and pull out going forward. So everything I do revolves around the idea of those facing forward in the direction that I am trying to go. And it really becomes important when you look at like City Southwest, for example. The rule that I try to go by is to always back up into the uh, into the track that the load's being let being put on so that I can pull out going forward. So specifically when you go to City Southwest, I want to go past that Y intersection so that I'm pulling forward north of the city and then back up whatever's going into the city, into the inbound track or wherever that it or wherever it's supposed to go. And that's just how I do it. And then I pull forward, back up to the rest of the train that isn't going to City Southwest, and then continue on down the continue on down the road. But bottom line is. I do everything so that my locomotives are facing forward to leave wherever it is that I'm going. And I think I looked at this last time. I don't think there's anything going up to the uh, machine factory military base. No. We've just got the tanks that I brought in last time. All right. So let me go turn off my locomotives because I think I'm probably going to stop here. And then depending on how well how well received this whole endeavor was, I'll decide if I'm going to do like a part two of the kind of like quote unquote tutorial stream on Wednesday or if I will uh, just go back to what I normally do, which is just kind of doing whatever comes to mind. But I wanted to try to explain, like, my uh, thought process and the logic behind why I do the things that I do in the game and, like, how I do them, like, the 
sequence of events that I go through when picking a job, what you do with the job, getting everything lined up so that it's organized the way that I want it to be organized in a way that makes sense to me. And just generally try to answer any questions about how you play the game or like what you actually do in it. And I like to think that I accomplished that. Basically, it was just me talking about a lot of things, but the difference between now and my other streams is I kind of had like a goal. Basically, I was worried in my previous streams that when I play Derail Valley specifically, it might kind of become like uh, uh, monotonous or like boring or like it gets repetitive or I'm doing like the same things over and over and over again. And that probably would not be very exciting or compelling to watch. So this time around, I woke up in the middle of the night a couple nights ago and I was just like, I should do a tutorial on how to actually play what I do to play this game. That sounds like a great idea. So, hence, this wonderful idea was born. So, to kind of wrap it up, I've talked about all three job types, what they mean, what you have to do with them, I briefly touched on the different licenses that you have access to in the game, many of which you need to take the jobs here at the harbor. So the harbor is probably better to save for later in the game when you have more licenses and you can do more things. Explained what shunting jobs are and how there's two different versions of them. You can be loading or unloading. How there are logistics jobs and how the empty cars generally go onto storage tracks. <clears throat> but I did not mention, I mean, I mentioned it in passing, but I did not specifically point out that there is a fourth track designation and that is anything with an L. That is a loading and unloading track. Every place that has one, well, every industry has one, but they have one of these consoles where you can load and unload anything on that track that is specifically inside in between the signs on both ends so like the loading zone is past this sign but before that sign so you have to get it in here and the comment about being between the signs is really important specifically with the logistics and shunting jobs where you may be putting cars on a track that already has things on it. So you have to make absolutely sure that the job that you're working on is completely on that track. If it's like too far sticking out past the sign, for one, it could be potentially fouling the adjacent switch. And for two, it uh, won't be in the zone to register as the job being completed. And the uh, thing that I've been kind of like beating around the bush mostly because I keep getting like sidetracked talking about something else but when you have to move another car 
in order to have access to like a specific track say it's too small to have both the jobs that you've got on it if you move that other job to my knowledge the job booklet will not update it still thinks that job is on that track so you have to remember that you moved it somewhere else and you may have potentially messed something up so doing multiple jobs in one place can get a little bit questionable i have to make sure that i have all three of my job booklets because uh had something weird happen the last time I went up to the machine factory and the game ate one of my job booklets and I had like four cars that no longer had a job on them. It was the most bizarre thing I've seen in the game up to this point. But yeah, I think I effectively explained what the jobs are, where they're sent, what they mean, what you have to do with them. And then I picked a couple of jobs going to a destination. I actually just came back from the last time that I played Derail Valley. And yeah, basically that's just a not exactly quick explanation of what I do in Derail Valley. So this has been my uh, improvised, uh, very late end game tutorial that just generally talks about how the mechanics work in the game as it sits right now. So this has been Derail Valley. Thank you all for watching, and have a nice day.